Hello and welcome to the Compass Podcast. Today we're joined by Shinobi, co-host of Block Digest. Shinobi digs into Bitcoin mining blind spots, such as pools, hosting, manufacturers, and much more. Hey, Shinobi. Thanks for joining us on the Compass Podcast. Really excited to dive into... Bitcoin mining blind spots with you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Yeah, so the impetus or reason for this podcast was your article in Bitcoin Magazine, I think it was in January, so a little over a month ago or so, maybe less, and you dug into centralization spots for Bitcoin mining, and I really appreciated the take because, and I also appreciate your your Twitter feed in general because I think you do ask the questions other people are are not wanting to ask. There's a lot of cheerleading in Bitcoin and you're not afraid to kind of to, to point them out. So uh, I thought we'd just kind of go through the article and for the audience, we can definitely link in today's show notes. You can kind of follow along there. Uh, but starting off this, the top, interesting thing in the subheader, the deck of the article was that you said one area of centralization can bleed into other areas in Bitcoin mining. And that leads to a centralization of the entire stack which I don't know if I necessarily completely agree with, but I'd like to get your perspective on why you think that is the case. If you know if manufacturing is centralized and Bitcoin mining becomes centralized, or if uh, PPAs are centralized, Bitcoin mining becomes centralized, or maybe hosting. Uh, what was your rationale for that comment? Well, it's just like if if you think about things, it's like an implicit order of dependency. Like you know, to just do like a, a real simple example like you know you have a job you have to go to work okay well you have to be present to that but you also need sleep so you need a place to sleep so you're well rested to be able to show up and do your job at work you need to eat so you need a way to get food to eat so that you have energy to show up to work and do your job and so if, if you just look at the silly example like that, if you don't have those other things, <clears throat> then you can't show up and do your job. And so there's that kind of implicit dependency beyond just having a job somewhere to actually go do that job. You need food. You need sleep. Without these things, you're not going to be alive to be able to do that job. And it's kind of the same thing when you look at the mining ecosystem. Like you, you need energy. If you don't have access to energy, you can have all the mining machines in the world. You can't mine because you can't run them. They need the electricity. Like and in the same sense, to have those mining machines, there needs to be a place to get them. If there is no place for you to get them, then even if you have electricity, you can't mine. And so there's that implicit like order of dependency there in terms of how everything affects everything else. The way I laid things out in the article, like bottom to top with everything kind of flowing upwards was energy production and then actual ASIC and machine manufacturing. Then the you know second hand market above that and then above that the geogra- or geographic distribution of equipment so how things are actually physically spread around then the ownership distribution and then finally at the top um you know mining pools and kind of my thinking here is if you go up the stack it can only really be as decentralized further up the stack as the most centralized thing in that stack. So to, to kind of just give like a, a real simple example, you know, let's say that all of the actual mining machines running in the world were ran by three people, but you have like a hundred different mining pools. Those mining pools aren't actually like that's meaningless. Like that does absolutely nothing to decentralize mining because three people own all of the machines. And so because that actual ownership of the hardware itself is so centralized, 
the only thing above it, the mining pools, can't actually be more decentralized than that thing below it, the ownership. Like that's just theater. It's just pretending because at the end of the day, those three people have physical control over all the machines. Interesting. Yeah, it's just to give a little pushback or maybe put it into my words, the way I've always thought about it is there, there's definitely a stack when it comes to Bitcoin mining. You have your manufacturers, you have your hosting providers, you have your energy providers, you have the people who are buying the machines themselves. It's all kind of part of that stack itself. But every single layer has its own part, right? So like the people who are in the energy industry have a different risk or attack vector than people in the manufacturing game. And not all those are necessarily correlated to each other. And so I do agree with your article in general that pools are definitely the most centralized part of Bitcoin mining. I'd like to maybe get a little more explanation on why you think they they interact with each other as much. Because if a pool provider would say, is attacked or somehow it colludes with another pool and they attack the network that doesn't necessarily mean that they're you know working with the energy providers or they're working with the manufacturers to do so uh, i could see how it's like a risk for bitcoin mining in general but i don't know how they bleed into each other as much so more explanation on that would be helpful i think for me at least well it's not about them necessarily colluding like a mining pool with a energy provider it's about the limitations on decentralization like you know let's say that uh, a dozen more mining pools popped up tomorrow that's not changing the ownership of the actual mining machines so it's like you you can point at like the the pretty pie graphs and go there's more mining pools so mining is more decentralized but nothing has changed in terms of who actually is owning and operating that hardware So like that level of decentralization is not improved at all just because there's more mining pools now. Like the the network can only be as decentralized as kind of the lowest rung down the whole ladder. You know what I mean? No, that does make sense. And I agree with you there wholeheartedly. Uh, Going to go off a side road here for a second and away from the, the main discussion, which will kind of follow the article, of course. But we've seen Luke Dasher, who's a well-known Bitcoin core developer, talk about SHA-256, the Bitcoin mining algorithm, maybe not being the perfect solution. Uh, I was in a recent tweet thread with him, and he was saying that he was against home mining. And the the reason he he is against home mining is because it's not profitable for home miners, in his opinion. And the basis for that is in Bitcoin itself, uh, was his argument. that SHA-256 needs to change or something like that needs to change in order to enable home mining again. Uh, on a practical level, that would basically mean changing consensus algorithms or changing SHA-256 to something else, uh, much like we see other altcoins purposely going about a different way of of protecting the network, maybe through a validation system of some sort. To me, that's pretty dangerous, and I don't know if I agree with it. I haven't thought all the way through it. Definitely. Luke Dasher's opinion is just one of many opinions out there, but I'd be interested to get your opinion on where you kind of see SHA-256 in the Bitcoin mining ecosystem, because the centralization aspects and risk risk factors you laid out are, they're significant and there's many of them. I mean, I completely disagree with Luke um, along like that whole line of argument. And I think really what it boils down to is he views ASIC boost as kind of like an attack or a vulnerability in um, SHA-256 because it's patented. And so he kind of sees that, at least, you know, my perspective looking at his arguments is that that creates kind of an unfair advantage for anybody holding that patent where they can kind of cheat and not have to do the same amount of work uh, for income that somebody who doesn't have access to that patent does. and. Yeah, I I just I completely think the idea right now of forking to a new proof of work algorithm is a total non-starter. We've had massive uh, strides forward in terms of efficiency of pushing down to lower nanometer nodes in terms of design. Like we are very far along the curve of mining equipment commoditizing. 
And I think without an active like a, attack or something disrupting the network, that is is like not something transitory, like a permanent problem, like short something like that happening. Um, that that entire conversation is a complete non-starter for me. That's just taking 10 steps backwards for no reason, because nothing actually disruptive to the network is happening right now. And that would just nuke all of the capital investment in that space. That comment does help contextualize the rest of the, the, our, our conversation. So I'm glad I asked it because a lot of the centralization aspects that you laid out in this article at first, and I think to someone who's new to Bitcoin mining, can come off as quite startling. If you talk to newbies in the space, one of the first things they talk about is this pool theater where pools can collude and attack the chain or censor transactions. Yeah. Anyone who's been around in Bitcoin for a while knows that the risks of that are are, are very small. They're present, but they're very, very small. Uh, so I'm glad you contextualize what you're saying around Luke's comments. Let's dive into the article. We can go it. We can go from the top or from the bottom. Maybe the top is easiest to talk about pool threat vectors. How do you lay out the pool threat to people that you're explaining Bitcoin mining to? And what is your current assessment of where we are at in the in the pool game? Well, I think really it's it's just a problem of convenience at this point. Uh, the income, it, it, well, pools are kind of necessary in one way or another uh, to have regular income as a miner. And so, you know, they exist currently, they aren't regulated in any fashion. So it's it's literally just point your miner at it. And as long as they don't exit scam, you know, you're making a more predictable income. But my big worry and problem especially given over the last two years with the push for all of these FATF regulations, specifically the travel rule, is I think that that is going to become the next thing that regulators go after, um, after exchanges. Um, and if you really look at what a mining pool is, it's a centralized service that custodies your funds until you actually withdraw them. And I think it's kind of mind boggling that regulators have not already started discussing regulating them as financial institutions um, in terms of mandating know your customer rules, um, actually applying, you know, the, the types of anti money laundering regulations um, traditionally placed on exchanges or other financial institutions. And I think it is a matter of time before that happens. So in terms of the centralization risk of mining pools, um, you know, as a, or a central custodial entity, like that's just a massive target for regulations wherever they're hosted. That's a massive target potentially for treating, say, an American miner dealing with a mining pool in China as interacting with a foreign Chinese financial institution. And I think there is absolutely zero chance that we do not start eventually going in that direction. And so kind of like as the top of the stack, the thing necessary to, you know, have that predictable, smooth minor income, like that needs to get fixed. Like we, we've had historically things like uh, P2 pool, which was literally a decentralized mining pool where everybody just has their own peer-to-peer -peer network with all the other miners they're pooling with. They all directly verify that the Coinbase is paying out to the individual mining operators that are participating in that pool. And when that block is found, all these individual miners are paid out directly from the Coinbase. Like that is a peer to peer protocol. There is no custodian, there is no like centralized entity there. And I think, you know, dealing with the scalability problems that a protocol like that ran into like a, a massive coinbase transaction that kind of limited the number of miners that can participate um eventually started creating um you know a minimum size of hash rate for you to be able to actually earn income predictably um those issues need to be sorted out um and there's there's a few different solutions on the table for that um some even involving lightning but you know, it's a matter of time before regulators start realizing that they can go after mining pools as custodial financial institutions. And so at the top of that stack, like 
that needs to get dealt with. Like that needs to be decentralized because if it isn't, then they just capture that coordination mechanism. And at that point, you're either talking about running an illegal pool that is in violation of whatever regulations they push or solo mining, which means the predictability of a miner's income, it just went out the window. And those are the only two options besides actually figuring out how to solve the problems of something like P2 pool so that we can actually have fully decentralized pools where there is no central point of attack there. Yeah, and I, I think this summer shows the validity of your claims right there. So China banned Bitcoin mining in June 2021, and a lot of pools went under. Uh, some Ethereum mining pools like Spark Pool and B Pool closed up shop uh, within three months, let go all of their Chinese employees and uh, vanished. Bitcoin mining, same thing happened. The only one that comes to mind right now is BTC Top, which uh, dissolved as an entity because of the legal pressure from the Chinese government uh, acting as a financial intermediary for Bitcoin mining. So definitely something to be cognizant of. Luckily, there are things like Matt Carello's project, uh, blinking on the name right now. And and better Hash. Better Hash, that's right. And then uh, Stratum V2. I'm not super familiar with where those projects are at at the current moment, but would you, your comments seem to claim that those are probably the most important things in, in for Bitcoin development right now, more important than other, other privacy aspects, more important than uh, Bitcoin side chains, more important than focusing on like other fungibility projects around, around Bitcoin mining. Would you agree with that or probably? I, I, I wouldn't say more important. I, I would say as important. But th- things like Better Hash, um, Stratum V2, they don't fully solve the problem. Um, they kind of get you halfway there. Like the, the protocol effectively lets the individual hardware operator um, decide what transactions go into the block if they happen to be the miner that, that finds the valid block in the pool. But those funds are still paid out to a centralized pool. So you, you've kind of created a situation where you can argue that you've maintained the censorship resistance because all of the individual hardware operators, if they want, can, you know, connect to the pool with their own node and select their own transactions for the block. But ultimately, the money is still being given to the pool to custody until they withdraw it. And so at that point, um, there's still the risk of regulations. There's still that financial um, relationship there that's custodial. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if that goes down a really bad road where you have regulations mandating transaction censorship, because that pool is still custodying the funds, they can just refuse to let you withdraw that um, if you are mining transactions that regulations require you to censor. It'd be an interesting world if every single Bitcoin ASIC or Bitcoin someone running a Bitcoin ASIC had to KYC with an exchange or KYC with a mining pool. That'd be a, a frightening world, but hopefully we're not moving closer towards that. With the FATF guidance, uh, I think you're definitely right that that is a threat factor. Uh, unless there's anything more to add on there, I want to keep going down the stack. I think the next thing you had within the article was hardware. Correct me if I'm wrong, but hardware centralization. Obviously, Bitmain is the 10,000 pound elephant in the room. Well, I mean, he, here the uh, the next layer is more about like the ownership of the equipment and like who's actually owning and operating. Um, and I am going to have to dig here a little bit at Compass um, in this section. But, you know, one of the big requirements for censorship resistance, in my opinion, is uh, a big diversity and distribution of who is actually owning and operating the, the mining hardware. And I think that this runs into a very big problem when you look at home mining, you know, especially with the jump um, around the S9. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the jump from 120 volt to 240 volt um, power supplies for the machines um, that completely changed the viability of actually having, you know, at your home, a mining operation like that maximal level of decentralization changed completely because prior to that shift, 
literally as long as you're not, you know, overdrawing power, you have it available. You just plug them into your home outlets everywhere. Like there, there is no limit except the actual transmission capacity from the utility company to your home. But with that 240 jump um, in most people's homes, all you really have is your washer and dryer line um, that can actually power that. You know, I mean, some people might have a 240 line in the garage or, you know, somebody like a, a carpenter or a worker who, who has a, you know, a workshop that they need tools for. But most people, they just have their washer and dryer line. So that's two machines you can plug in and you can't do your laundry while that's plugged in. Like to try and expand beyond that, you need electricians. You need to talk to your utility company. You have to have new like uh, transmission capacity hooked up to your house. It, it becomes a major barrier. And so that kind of, in its own way, sets a limit on how decentralized the actual hardware ownership and operation can be. Are you saying that home mining would be the best situation for Bitcoin where everyone is able to mine from home and there wouldn't be any sort of industrialization around Bitcoin mining? From the point of view of maximal decentralization, absolutely. Um, But, you know, there's a lot of these logistical issues here, which is obviously where a business like Compass steps in. And this, I think, is a huge issue in this space when looking at mining centralization. Because, you know, from a legal perspective, um, people who've actually gotten machines up and running, um, you know, when you've had them available, they have a legal claim to that ownership, but they don't have any physical control over that. Like that's in Compass's control. Um, That's bound by the contractual arrangements that's bound by you know anything you might be mandated to do by law that's also a factor when looking at you know farms set up in different jurisdictions like those people might have a legal claim here in America to those machines but they're now exposed to the risk of an entirely different jurisdiction somewhere where that machine is actually physically hosted and so that's effectively in an adversarial environment, completely removed any meaningful benefit in terms of somebody having a legal claim to it. They don't have any physical control over it. And, you know, to kind of make a point here, I forget, I, I want to say North Carolina, but that facility that uh, you guys were running where when the lease was up, the owner actually just decided to, you know, kick Compass out and start mining for themselves. You know, these are all the the types of issues here. Like now that machine's not plugged in. It's not doing anything to generate income for that person. And it's just sitting around not being used to secure the network. And that's, that's ultimately because of the centralized nature of where that's actually being hosted and operated, despite the legal claim that all your customers have to that machine. Yeah, definitely. And I I don't disagree with you on many of these things. I guess the pushback would be reality demands and Bitcoin itself, Bitcoin's consensus, Bitcoin's uh, protocol itself demands that a certain amount of hash rate be used and able to mine coins. And when you touch the meat space, home mining, just it's viable in some situations, but not for a vast majority of people, but people still want to be able to mine Bitcoin. And so they have to make certain trade-offs, right? So when you're Considering trade-offs, that's that's where my argument would be is it's better to have a spectrum of options for mining Bitcoin. Obviously, home mining or some sort of situation like that where I can everyone can plug an ASIC into their garage and secure the network would be the the most beneficial. But we don't really live in that world, right? We see the same thing with exchanges. It would be great if everyone was using BISC or something like that, or local bitcoins or or Paxful or something similar. But we live in a in a world of differences where some people the easiest way they're going to get onboarded to, to Bitcoin is their Coinbase. Uh, so it to me it just seems that the home mining to the industrialized spectrum is the reality of of the situation we live in, and you have to do the best with it. Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I can't really argue that there is market demand for these things, but this is setting kind of that floor 
if something like that exists or is the situation, then things cannot meaningfully become more decentralized than that. The next one on the list is geographic distribution of equipment, which of course is a huge thing across the board. And luckily, Bitcoin mining has become more decentralized this year with China banning Bitcoin mining. At one point, over 60% of China's or of the Bitcoin mining hash rate was in China. And now it's spread out across multiple different jurisdictions, uh, mainly in the United States at this point, about 30% is the last numbers I looked at. But some people are saying that could increase even to 50% in the near future. What's your take on where we're at right now? And are you pretty happy with what happened over the last two years? You know, honestly, I don't think that what China did is good for Bitcoin. And I feel like what is going on right now is just a top heavy shift from China to America. And I think at the end of the day, that just puts things in the same like risk model um, and potentially even worse because, you know, people have this idea of China <clears throat> that it is some completely omni or omniscient like police state and they see everything that everyone is doing everywhere. And that's not really how that works. Like if uh, Alex Berg actually a um, couple of years back wrote a piece on this, but when you look at the hash rate that was in China, it was a majority of the network's hash rate, but it was actually pretty widely distributed through China. And if you know anything about China, <clears throat> they there is all kinds of illegal shit there um, that happens that just does not pop up on the radar. Like um, I forget the exact percentage. But a lot of the aluminum smelting in China is actually done completely illegally. Um, it's not regulated. It's not following Chinese law, um, but it happens anyway. And despite a majority of the hash rate being in China, you know, the way I always looked at it was it would be a lot harder to go around and actually enforce that everywhere in any kind of way that would meaningfully disrupt the network. But now that things have shifted over here to America, um, things don't really work like that. Uh, it's a lot more out in the open. There's not really that massive scale of like power stealing or bribing, you know, local provincial uh, government offices to kind of just look the other way. Um, everything's out in the open. And so when it comes to regulations, and kind of mandating things that would be detrimental for the network out of American hash rate, um, it's way easier over here than it would have been in China. And so if, if we keep seeing this migration to America and a majority of the hash rate wind up in North America, I think that is a very bad thing. Um, like well, once you have a majority of the hash rate in a single jurisdiction or a handful of jurisdictions that are very cooperative and friendly with each other, um, that's when you start getting into dangerous territory. That's when, <clears throat> you know, mining attacks or disruptions to the network or censorship start becoming actually feasible because just a jurisdiction or two going snap, these are the rules now, well, you have to follow them or leave. What if they don't let you leave like that? That becomes a, a massive geopolitical issue. You know, like what if uh, OFAC just started rapidly expanding their list of uh, blacklisted coins and then mandated all miners in North America stop processing transactions from them? Miners want to get up and leave. What if the U.S. government says, no, you can't? Um, this is a national security issue now. Like that hash rate needs to stay here so that Bitcoin does not maintain that censorship resistance and become something that can be used for nefarious means. Interesting. Yeah, definitely an interesting perspective on that. One thing I want to throw back to you, since your opinion is definitely different than a lot of people I've seen so far, what do you think about on a larger macro geopolitical landscape where we're seeing China bans Bitcoin mining, therefore the United States and Western powers as quote unquote, enemies or adversaries against communist China embrace Bitcoin. We've seen a lot of rhetoric about that from Senator Ted Cruz and others that Bitcoin mining should be embraced because communist China is against it. Is that a threat factor for Bitcoin because we have new influence on the network from politicians? Or is that a, bad, or like a good thing in general because we're seeing um, political ties being brought into Bitcoin itself? 
I don't trust any of these politicians or a- any of this flapping mouths about America and Bitcoin. Um, they're all fucking corrupt. They, they all give lip service and then turn around and do whatever they find to be the best thing for their own interests. And the way I look at that is just trying to attract hash rate. And like I said, once enough of it is here, the regulations are going to start coming. Interesting. Okay. Let's keep, keep moving down the line. I actually tend to agree with you on that point, though I do think that in the long run, the fact that Communist China banned Bitcoin mining could have good implications for Bitcoin in the short run. But in the long run, I, I definitely agree with you. So the next two on the list are secondhand equipment markets and then equipment manufacturing markets. Maybe for just ease of time here, we can put these two together. There definitely is a lack of, of market in Bitcoin mining ASIC across the board. We've seen a lot of those pop up this year as there has been more liquidity with Bitcoin's price going up. The price of these Bitcoin ASICs have gone up and there's been tremendous demand for purchasing and selling them across the board. So we've seen a few marketplaces pop up. Also seen uh, the equipment game change considerably over the last few years due to secondary markets popping up and then uh, a more pressure on demand from equipment manufacturers, right? Bitmain has been the dominant player in the game, but Kanan, MicroBT, and others are popping up. Square is now looking at creating its own ASIC. Blockstream just purchased Spendulis, and they're looking at booting up their ASIC manufacturing again. How, on the macro level or a very generous level, are you looking at the ASIC market as a threat vector to Bitcoin? Well, um, to kind of touch on the secondhand market before I get into that, I think that is one of the most important things because all of the relationships with actual manufacturers are getting more and more exclusive. Um, you know, if I just want to go buy a single machine to plug in at my house, that, that's not as easy because you have all of these companies like HUD8, like Grid, like Compass going straight to the manufacturers with bulk orders. And, you know, they're going to prefer that. It's, it's more predictable. It's more steady income and revenue for them. And it's a lot less hassle logistically than dealing with a bunch of individual customers. So the existence of secondhand markets is incredibly important just to have equipment available for those smaller independent operators to actually have access to. Whether it's somebody just plugging in a machine or two, you know, in their laundry room, or somebody down in Texas who's filling a little hut with a bunch of them because they have a gas wall on their property. Like it is incredibly important for a secondhand market to exist for them to actually have, you know, competitive, timely access to hardware. Otherwise, that entire class of Miner is just going to be slowly pushed out of the market. Um, as far as manufacturing, um, well, Blockstream purchasing Spoondoolies, um, that is a very old company. And the last design that they actually implemented is very out of date. So that, from my perspective, is a bet on the team being able to actually design a modern competitive chip. Um, I'm not really sure how to gauge the viability of that or even, you know, start considering timeframes. Um, Square, I would say the same thing, but even worse, because they don't have an experienced team who, who's worked in that space, to my knowledge. So I, I would love to see both of those things work out. But, you know, I'm, I'm waiting to see actual material progress before I even consider that as a factor. I would look more at Intel. And what they're doing, because they have apparently been tweaking designs for years now, and <clears throat> they have their own fab plants. So it's it's not like Bitmain or Micro or Avalon, where they have to go to Samsung or TSMC. They can just fab them themselves. Like they don't have to compete with the order queue for fab time. They don't have to deal with any of that. If they see a market, they can just fab them directly themselves. And <clears throat> honestly, um, I hope that we see all of the semiconductor manufacturers out there start going in this direction, but there, there's only so much decentralization that can occur there, which is why I, I think that secondhand markets are so important. 
um, you know, chip fab plants take billions of dollars and years to put together. You're like, things are going to get weird there. Like we've seen over the last two years, um, you know, a shortfall in ASIC production because all of these fab plants have been trying to play catch up with all the, the supply chain wonkiness since 2020. Over the next couple of years, if the price keeps appreciating, I could see the exact opposite of that happening. Conventional, you know, electronics manufacturers not being able to get fab time because they're churning out Bitcoin ASICs. I think the best that, that we can hope for is that AMD, NVIDIA, Samsung, Intel, like they're doing now, all, all of these companies start getting into that game. And beyond that, like you're talking billions of dollars just to get a fab set up and then you have to recoup all that cost. So like that is a centralization point that's only going to go so far in terms of decentralizing. And it gets even worse when you consider the fact that all of the machines used in a uh, fabrication plant, um, there's really only a single company in the entire world that manufactures those machines. Um, ASML, uh, or hold on. Yeah, I, I might be, yeah, that, that might be the wrong acronym, but it's a uh, company in the Netherlands. And like they're the only game in town. So, like that choke point, um, yeah, I, I don't see that changing more than like a little nudge or two until we're all old men. Just to uh, contextualize or maybe put your thoughts into my own words, I think for the equipment game across the board, whether that be on secondary markets or primary markets, direct from manufacturer, it seems to be a capital problem, right? Bitcoin mining has only been around as an industry for about 10 years now when the first ASIC started rolling out in 2013. And it quickly turned into a capital allocation game, whether that's finding the chips, making the chips, making the machines, or purchasing equipment. Like you said, you typically have to do it in bulk orders. And uh, the, the it's been a very new thing to be able to purchase one machine. Typically, it's been done in very shady telegram groups where it's very easy to get ripped off and only this year, last year, have we seen professional companies come around that are offering MOQs of one machine. And even those companies have to order large deals from ASIC manufacturers in order to uh, get cheaper costs for customers. Uh, idea I want to throw across your bow and see what you think about it. It does seem like things are getting better as opposed to worse. There's more capital moving into the game. It's a capital-intensive part of Bitcoin itself, and more people are attracted towards that. It seems like the market is recognizing this and pushing for decentralization. For an example, Square getting into making an ASIC, even if it fails, they're putting research and development money into it, and maybe someone else wins because of it. And that seems, that's just a, a pure market process. Uh, you can see that on the secondary market side as well. There's been a lot of marketplaces that popped up this last year that previously didn't exist and they exist now because the prices of ASICs have gone up with the price of Bitcoin. Uh, are you generally bullish on this part of decentralization uh, on the equipment game itself or are you uh, more bearish? I mean, I think it will absolutely get better, but only so far. I'm not going to name names, but there are people in this space who have said delusional things like if Bitcoin was completely outlawed all over the world, somebody would start up a chip fab plant somewhere and start making ASICs illegally. And it, it, that's delusional. Like you're talking a multi-billion dollar investment with the type of energy consumption requirements that it's like any state in the world would find that like that. And like, that's a, a factor to consider here. Like, you know, Intel starts getting into ASIC manufacturing. Do you think they're going to be allowed to sell ASICs to Iran? or some countries in South America or Africa? No, they're going to be restricted from doing that. And like, no matter how much overall in the absolute sense that that situation decentralizes more than it is now, it still is pretty centralized in the grand scheme of things. And that's going to have a lot of consequences to all the other factors, like specifically geographic distribution of hardware. Like if Intel cannot sell 
those machines to a bunch of locations because of sanctions or the American government's view on the government in, in these other countries, then that's going to hurt the level of geographic decentralization. No, I definitely agree with you. I'm generally bullish on this part of the industry itself. And I think this kind of ties back to the geographical dispersion topic we hit on earlier, which really just comes down to the legalese of Bitcoin mining. And I think in the short term, more politicians getting involved and politicians, basically, they want to get back in office and they want jobs for the constituents. This is a this is a good indicator that uh, politicians are getting into to Bitcoin because then we'll have uh, more people getting into Bitcoin mining uh, and decentralizing this layer. I think in the long run, I, I still agree with you that politicians are in it just for themselves and we'll definitely see some regulation coming along. Uh, leaving that part aside, though, moving to the last topic, which is energy production, which is a very interesting part of the centralization topic itself for many reasons. And I won't ramble on too much, but my understanding is this is one of the most centralized aspects of Bitcoin mining because of the different energy sources are basically walled gardens, right? There's a few that you can get out there. You mentioned the article flare and natural gas uh, mining is, is an option for getting around uh, with the wall gardens of energy production. But besides that, it can be hard. Like I've seen some people put solar panels on the roof and mine Bitcoin that way. That obviously also has centralization risks. What is your take on the energy markets when it comes to Bitcoin mining? Well, um, if you're plugged into a power grid, um, you are subject to whatever that utility company is going to do and whatever the government will mandate them to do. <clears throat> so it is, yeah, it is the most centralized aspect of this. And, you know, yeah, somebody can throw some solar panels on the roof, but that's incredibly expensive. That's not going to power a lot of machines. That's not really sustainable with enough individuals to meaningfully decentralize hardware operation. And really, the, the only option right now is flare gas mining. Like that is the only thing disconnected from a power grid where a utility company can't just flip it off. Somebody has to physically show up at each and every flare gas site and shut things down, which makes it way more expensive to actually enforce any type of, of regulation or restrictions. And <clears throat> really, the, the only other thing uh, would be small nuclear reactors. but. When you really sit down and think about it in the same way that the power grid is a massive point of centralization, you can just be shut off from. So is nuclear fuel. Like that, that is one of the most government manipulated and regulated markets in the entire world. So yeah, um, anything uranium based, it's the exact same situation. <clears throat> you can just not be given fuel. And really, I think the only viable option there is uh, thorium reactor designs, <clears throat> because the the lower level of radioactivity, the inability to weaponize it, um, hopefully, if that technology is actually developed, will be way less strict of a, a market than uranium is. And hopefully that would allow for some type of meaningful you know, access and, and competition in, in a market for fuel for those types of things. But short, that actually materializing and being developed and not regulated as heavily as uranium, yeah, I, I do not see any option out there besides flare gas that is not just <clears throat> building the entire castle on that one linchpin that can just get yanked out because they can just shut you out of the grid whenever they want. Yeah, the two things that have come onto the spotlight for me recently is mini hydro farms that you can run. A lot of people have access to creeks. There's a lot of hydro plants actually across the United States uh, that have basically been abandoned or just turned into museums of some sort. And you can get enough energy out of them to boot up a small Bitcoin farm. I've also seen the gravity wells, which are really interesting, where you put a huge weight high up on a pedestal, or sometimes you can do it underground as well. And then the slow dropping force of that large mass turns into electricity, spins a turbine, obviously. And uh, those are two things that are really interesting to me in the long run, see if those develop. But I think it kind of comes back to the earlier topic about capital allocation. 
Bitcoin mining is only becoming more capital intensive, especially as difficulty goes up. And those two types of energy be difficult to say if they provide enough uh, energy for their cost basis. I think you're spot on with the flared gas. There's a lot of energy you can get out of that. The downside is you have to have access to a well site, which of course also has a lot of capital and domain specific knowledge uh, tied up in it. So I think I think the the energy part is definitely a centralization vector that a lot of people don't think about. Uh, but Shinobi, I want to thank you for your time today. I appreciate the conversation. A lot of interesting and nuanced takes on Bitcoin mining blind spots. Mm-hmm. You know, thanks for having me. But um, you know, just one last comment I want to make um, in terms of like the problems with hosting facilities like Compass Runs. Um, I really think the dependence on the power grid is like a big issue there. You know, like you guys have been having a lot of problems in terms of facilities, um, getting them up, getting machines online quick enough. And like all of that is just centralized in kind of those big baskets of these large facilities hooked up to the grid. Whereas something like hunting around for, you know, flare gas wells, it, it might be a little more logistically um, complicated, but it's a lot more flexible. It's a lot more dynamic. Um, you know, the risk of a, a flare gas operator deciding <clears throat> when this lease is up, I'm going to mine myself. That's not going to be the type of hit it is to you and your customers as, say, that facility in North Carolina. It's just one gas well. And, you know, I think obviously, um, all my problems with <clears throat> this type of hosting business model aside, there is obviously demand for them. Um, they're going to continue to exist, but they can be decentralized. They can be more distributed than they are now with these massive warehouses. And I think that would be a net win in every way in terms of the risk to your customers, the risk to you, um, the ability to actually minimize you know the exposure to different jurisdictions having things spread all over the place instead of concentrated in in one or two facilities and i think if if these types of business models are going to continue to exist like those types of paths should be explored yeah i think those are pretty measured comments uh i will say as just my two sats the Natural gas and just the flaring mining has been something I've been looking at a lot recently. I've been talking with Jay Energy and then talking with Neil, who runs our, he's our facilities director or mining operations director here at Compass. And I've gotten two very different takes on it. People in natural gas and oil are very bullish on it. And obviously, you're always going to be bullish on your own industry. And then here at Compass, uh, Neil, who's been running mines for five plus years now, been in Bitcoin for about 10 years. He's very bearish on it across the board because he thinks it's just too capital intensive and people are looking at it as some sort of uh, fix it all solution for Bitcoin mining. So I would say that I think there is a conversation to be had around flared gas that it's been very bullish one direction so far this last year, uh, which could turn out to be correct, but I think there's a lot more capital that goes into it than most people are are thinking about in the, the first part. Uh, second, I would say that the hosting angle is really interesting. Um, we, didn't, we didn't get kicked out of any facilities. The issue was uh, permits actually on a state level. Uh, again, it comes down to it. It's a threat vector for centralization, which I'm glad that uh, we had you on the podcast to talk about it. Uh, every facility has to have proper permits when you're working on a grid system, right? And that means that you have to have the state involved. And in this case, the state uh, didn't like a, f- a vending facility we we're working with. Um, and so we ended that relationship because the state didn't approve it. Uh, so I think you're totally right. There's a lot of different threat vectors out there that need to be understood better. Uh, and there's, in my opinion, there's not a one fix all solution quite yet, but it's something that's to be explored, and luckily, there's a lot of incentives around finding those solutions because of Bitcoin. People, people just need to keep in mind that like things don't just solve themselves. People solve them because <clears throat> they have an incentive to. And you know, if everybody just 
pretends that problems don't exist and they, they stick their head in the sand, then no one's going to try and solve them because they don't even think they're there. Well, we can leave the conversation there. Again, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me on.